two, one. Oops. I don't want to see my fat face. Okay. <laughs> right. Go for it. Okay, thank you, Carlos. We have the help, as you have noted, week by week, of expert technical people who know how these extraordinary cameras and internet work. So by now you have rebooted, whatever that word means, you found the right button that gets you back on. Again, this is a miracle. I don't apologize for saying that week by week that we can speak to you at great distance in different parts of the world. We're in the 13th chapter of Revelation. I have counseled you to use not the King James Bible, which is out of date. The English is foggy, especially for your children, and it's not translated from the best and oldest manuscripts. Use the New American Standard Updated Version or the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, the RV, the Revised Version, the American Standard Version. All of that would be fine. And buy one when you invest in a Bible with the marginal references. <coughs> what they do is to connect the verses. And the Jews knew the way you study the Bible is to connect verses which remind you of themselves. You find a verse that speaks about the dragon, you say, oh, what's the dragon? Well, in your margin, you find in the NASV, there's a reference even to Genesis chapter 3. So the dragon is defined as the devil. I want to make that point clear to people in Revelation 20 verse 2, within the very same book you have in Revelation 20 verse 2, he laid hold, this angel grabbed, arrested the dragon, the serpent of old, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and the Satan, that's the Greek word, the avalos, devil, and the Hebrew word, the Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. The same fact is mentioned in Revelation 12, verse 7, which says, there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, we all know Michael is an archangel, waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. And down in verse 9, the great dragon was thrown down in the future, to us even. He was the serpent of old, who is called the devil and the Satan. He has Three names there, the devil, the Satan, the dragon, four names actually, the serpent, who is deceiving <coughs> the entire world. That's an amazing feat, to be deceiving the entire world. So if you're wise, you'll pray the great Bible prayer, which in his book he reports as saying something like this. He prayed to God and said, oh God, if I'm deceived, please undeceive me. So these are code words, if you like but very significant ones. And so that's the dragon in chapter 13, where we are this morning, standing on the sand of the seashore, on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast. So we've got another symbol, another symbolic word here, a beast, a beast coming up out of the sea. Now that wasn't a literal beast. It happens to be a person, and I'll tell you how you can tell that. In verse 8 of this same chapter, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, the beast. We who do languages are fascinated by the fact that the word, the word beast is actually a neuter in Greek. It's a neuter, not a masculine or feminine word. But here, John or Jesus has written the word him. That breaks the laws of language. That really should be it. But it's not. The beast is here defined as him, meaning a person. And down in the 14th verse of the same chapter, you'll find that this beast, this second beast, actually, I think it is, when we get to the story here, there's a beast who is deceiving those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which had been given him to perform in the presence of the first beast, coming to two beasts, obviously, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who. That really should be the beast which, if you want to be strictly grammatically correct, 
But John, or Jesus, who wrote these books, these words for us, has deliberately told you that the beast, as well as the dragon, is a person. The beast who, masculine. That, for those of us who do the languages of the Bible, is quite fascinating because, strictly speaking, that beast should be a witch. W-H-I-C-H. -H. But in fact, in the Greek, the beast is a who, W-H-O, showing that it is a person. And fascinatingly enough, since you're in Revelation 13, 14, I would invite you to turn to Mark 13, 14, chapter 13 of Mark, which is the famous Olivet Discourse of Jesus, found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. But in Mark 13, 14, Jesus said something exceedingly interesting and important. Jesus said this in Mark 13, 14, parallel with Revelation 13, 14. You can remember it easily. 13, 14 of Revelation and 13, 14 of Mark. Jesus said in Mark 13, 14, when you see the abomination of desolation, the devastating, abominable person standing where he ought not to. Some of your translations didn't get the point here. Many of them do correctly. Jesus didn't say where it, the abomination of desolation, is standing. He said where he ought not to. That shows you that the abomination of desolation is an abominable, disgusting person standing in the future where he ought not to. So, if you see this, then, let the reader understand. Interesting in parenthesis there. Let the reader, don't miss this extraordinarily interesting point that the abomination of desolation, found, of course, in the book of Daniel, is a person standing where he ought not to, standing in the temple, as Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2. Then, if you're in Judea, you're to flee to the mountains. That's a very significant point. Jesus did not believe in what's called a pre-Great Tribulation rapture, a snatching of the saints to heaven, as is very popularly taught in America. It's just a falsehood. If Jesus had believed in a pre-Great Tribulation snatching to heaven, why would he have told his people to flee to the mountains? Think about that. You don't tell people to flee to the mountains if you know they're going to be taken up to heaven. So that's just a falsehood, particularly in the American system, by which most Christians who go to church on this very Sunday are fully believing that before the abomination is really revealed, they'll be snatched off to heaven. It's false. Jesus said to those people living in Judea, flee, escape, run away to the hills. Now what you're doing if you're in Georgia isn't said in the Bible. So we're going to have to play it by ear and see what we have to do at that point if we happen to live to that time. But anyway, I wanted to make that point clear. When you speak of rapture, please do not ever say rapture by itself, because the word has become a fog word. It means nothing now. There is a rapture, a catching up to meet the Lord. That's in 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul speak about, speaks about Christian, the faithful of all the nations being raptured to heaven, caught up that's a genuine catching up, but it's not pre-tribulation. So when your friends ask you about the rapture, you say, well, what are you talking about? They're probably talking about a false pre-great tribulation rapture. That's a falsehood. It will be very disappointing for people when they find they are not removed from the earth when this beast power, this evil person, arises. So all of that, I think, needs to be explained. Isn't that what happened with the so-called great disappointment? Yes, that also, as Carlos rightly says, in the 1800s and 1844, somebody predicted the end of the age and the beginning of the kingdom. And when that didn't happen in 1844, it was a great disappointment. So we as Christians must not promise what is false, because liars will have their place in the lake of fire. We don't want to make false promises. That would be an exceedingly destructive idea. So all of that then by way of introduction to Revelation 13, where the dragon, who is the serpent, who is the ancient Genesis serpent, all the Jews believe that, by the way, in the Septuagint you'll find that serpent is taken to be the devil, 
and all the Jewish writings identified that original devil with the serpent. And Paul, I won't turn to it for the sake of time, but Paul, I think in sec in First Corinthians eleven or Second Corinthians eleven, it would be, actually says it was the serpent who deceived Eve. It was the serpent. Now, if you say that that serpent is really a literal snake, <coughs> you're accusing God. You don't mean to do it, but you're accusing God of a monstrous thing. Would God then curse an innocent snake? Don't tell me a literal snake is innocent. Or guilty. Animals, I think, don't have moral conditions like that. So God cursed that snake from the very start. And Paul said that Satan, the deceiver, the serpent, deceived Eve. And Revelation 20, verse 2, we just read it, and 12, verse 7 says that the serpent is, the serpent is called the devil and the serpent. All right, all of that then is to say that in Revelation 13, it's the dragon, the ancient serpent who is the devil, and he's then seen to be standing on the edge of the seashore. The sea in the Bible is often the Mediterranean. And I saw a beast who is a person, because as I mentioned to you, the beast in verse 8 and verse 14 is taken to be a person. He's given personality just as Jesus gave the abomination of desolation personality, human personality, in Mark 13 and 14. So you've got enough there to preach from dawn till dusk to your children and anybody else that will listen on who this beast is. He had ten horns and seven heads. I'm not going to comment on the seven heads because I don't know exactly how all of that works, but the ten horns are significant. Why are the ten horns so significant? Because Jesus is going to fight those ten horns when he comes back. That's over, what, in Revelation 20? There are ten horns, or which verse is that exactly? There are ten horns, and Jesus is going to fight them deliberately, the ten horns. Um, so that shows that those ten horns would have to be existing at the time of the future second coming. What, what verse is that in Revelation? Somebody got it for me. The ten horns are ten kings. <coughs> they are said to be, somebody will find that for me, I'm sure, very quickly. We know their future because they're going to be fighting with Jesus when he comes back. My Bible is so overmarked now, I'm going to have to get a new one because it's not possible for me to follow my Revelation. own sign. Revelation? 12.3? 12, 12.3 12, uh, 12, might no. be it. Uh, another sign. A huge red dragon, seven heads, ten horns. Certainly that's a parallel, but that's not the one I'm looking for. We're going to find this. We'll find it very easily with our combined technological expertise here. Well, if anyone else. Ten kings which are going to be fighting, who are going to be fighting <coughs> Jesus when he comes back. We'll find that. I promise you we'll find it. 17, 10, uh, 12? 17, 17, 12? 12. 10 horns you saw are 10 kings. That's one. Who have not yet received the kingdom. Yes. But who for one hour, hour yeah. will receive authority Good. as kings along with the beast. All right. What, what verse was that? 17, 12. 1712, thank you, you found it. 1712, here we have the definition <coughs> of ten kings. 1712, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, rulers, who have not yet received the power to rule, their kingdom, a government, but they're going to receive authority as kings with the beast <coughs> for one hour. And they will wage war in verse 14. These ten kings will wage war <coughs> against the Lamb. You know who the Lamb is. That's Jesus, the Lamb, 28 times in the book of Revelation. The Lamb, and the Lamb is going to defeat them because he, the Lamb, is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him, that's the saints with him, are the called, chosen faithful, and I should add, elect. They're the elected saints of God, 
all the true believers who are along with Jesus fighting against the ten kings. So we're defining our terms here best we can. So you now know that there are ten kings. And if you want a reference then for your own studies, I would refer you to Psalm 83, fascinating psalm. Many commentators who have studied this have pointed us to Psalm 83. Well, guess what? You find ten kingdoms listed in verse 5. They have conspired together with one mind. That also reminds us of the book of Revelation. One mind. They're united in their one mind in verse 5 of Psalm 83. Against God, against his Messiah, as it will be in the future, they've made a covenant, please notice. They've made an alliance. How many of these are there? Edom, one. Ishmaelites, two. Moab, three. Hegarites, four. These are Arab countries. Gebel, five. Ammon, six. Amalek, seven. Philistia, eight. <coughs> and Tyre, excuse me, is nine. And guess who else is there? Assyria, number 10. That's 10 nations. Sounds awfully like the 10 nations. So if you're looking for this in the future, it would be a combined <coughs> Middle Eastern Arab type of confederation of 10 kings, I suggest. And you'll notice in verse 8, they have become a help to the children of Lot. Well, the children of Lot were already mentioned, so you don't have to add them. They were already mentioned. So that, I think, completes a series of 10. These could well be then the ten kings who fight Jesus at his second coming. Now we do have Middle Eastern events currently which remind us of this sort of thing. I'm not saying for one moment that the current political situation is exactly what the Bible mentions. But I will say the Bible, though, <clears throat> has Middle Eastern things in mind when it speaks of the future. So keep your eye on the Middle East. Rome was always taken to be the fourth kingdom. I doubt whether that's correct, because Rome is not the same geographical arena as the other kingdoms mentioned before, that's to say Medo-Persia and Greece. They were all Western Asian kingdoms, and it's likely then that Western Asia would be the scene of the future kingdom too. That would be all then on the same geographical scene, same geographical location. So watch out for the future and for the Middle East, and especially Arab kingdoms who are going to threaten the nation of Israel. That's most interesting. I would say then that God has a plan to bring his own ethnic people, Israel, back into a cognizance of him and knowing of him, and they are currently not in that state. So far, they've rejected the Messiah. They killed their own Messiah, the Jewish people did. And that's going to be then a big change when God shakes his Middle Eastern Jewish, we call them Jews now, wherever the Jews are exactly, many of them are in Israel, and God is going to have them attacked. And that's going to be a time of supreme trouble, great tribulation, which will affect all of us who are alive at that time. So that's the scene that I would set then in Revelation 13, and also to say that Revelation 13 is an exposition of Daniel 7. We won't read the whole of that chapter now, but right here in my marginal references, in my New American Standard Updated Bible, we have Daniel 7, prominent, and the next verse we have is Hosea 13, verse 7. So let's go back to that one. We turn from verse to verse, it takes time Bible study takes time. It's not an exercise that can be achieved in a few seconds. So if you go back to Hosea 13, verse 7, what do we find there? We read this. God is speaking here. I will be like a lion to them, to Israel, his people, like a leopard. I, God, will lie in wait by the wayside. I would encounter them like a bear. So you've got a lion, a leopard, a bear, and I will tear open their chests. That's not a nice thing to be reading on Sunday, but we have to read it. God is threatening his own people, Israel, what I would call ethnic Jewish people today, we call them that. I'm not talking about the church, who is the international Israel of God, the international church, 
drawn from every nation on the earth. It's also called Israel in the New Testament, called the Israel of God. The true circumcision of God is us. We're talking, though, about the literal ethnic Jewish people, wherever they are exactly, but certainly they're in the Middle East. And God is going to be attacking them in a way that reminds us even of the language of Revelation 13, like a lion, a leopard, a bear, and tearing open their chest. And then it says, there I will also devour them like a lioness as a wild beast would tear them. Interesting. So a wild beast is involved in an attack on Israel, the ethnic Jewish people, as we call them today. Not to forget that the international Israel is the church of God, the true church of God, wherever those true believers will be and are. That's also the Israel of God. Israel of God. There are people who were taught correctly that in the Bible, Israel means the ethnic uh, Jewish people, as we were called. That was absolutely splendid. It brought back a whole lot of good information. But in going from one thing to another, they tended to overlook the fact that the church, the international church drawn from every nation on earth, is also called Israel in a different sense. Hence the phrase Israel of God in Galatians 6.16 and the true Israel of the people of God. So I want to make that absolutely clear. Otherwise, our definitions are vague, and we misread the Bible very easily. And then in verse 2, the beast, which is a person, as we showed you in verse 8 and 14, a person, which I saw was like a leopard, like a bear, and the dragon, who is the <coughs> serpent, the devil, gave that beast his power and his throne and great authority. That's extraordinary, isn't it? You can't, can't get any worse than that. You've got the devil giving this extraordinary authority to this beast-like person. Then I saw one of the heads of the beast, there were seven of them, as if it had been slain. I'm not quite sure exactly how that fits into history, if it does, or maybe it's future, but we'll see perhaps another week if we get some more counsel on that first. And the fatal wound that made that beast look as though it had been killed was healed. <clears throat> that may be a future event yet. We'll wait and see. I have counselors out there listening, maybe even to us today, who've given this a lot of thought, and so I will appeal to them. Perhaps they'd like to interact with us, with us now. Exactly what is that healing of the beast? But when it happens, the whole earth was astonished. And they said, wow, this is amazing. And what did they do? Not being well informed, they followed after that beast, that anti-Christian figure. And they said, who is able to wage war with him? So he must be a very military person, this beast, I'm, I'm sure, with tremendous control, and he's got the devil working directly behind him. And there was given to him a mouth to this beast, speaking arrogant words, great things, literally, great things, arrogance. He was a, a, a person who was entirely taken up with himself, arrogant to the point of extreme madness, but very powerful, and blasphemies. And he was given authority to act to be in charge for how long? 42 months. Well, you're not going to read the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation with any understanding unless you understand that 42 months is the same as three and a half years, is the same exactly as 42 months, a time, a times, and half a time. That particular expression occurs, we won't look them all up today, but you should take time to do it, it occurs no less than seven times in the book of Daniel and five times in the book of Revelation, so it must be most significant. It is the last half, the last three and a half years of a final period of seven years. You may know, we won't do it now in detail, but in Daniel 9, the last seven years of a period of 490 years, which is 70, if you can handle the math here, mathematics here, <coughs> 70 times 7, 490 years. And the last seven years of that 
famous period of time, is cut off from the rest. So 69 of those sevens takes you up to the first coming of Jesus. And after that, you'll find there's an abomination of desolation who functions in that last period of 490 years, i.e. the last period of seven years. And then you divide that last period of seven years into half, and you call it three and a half and three and a half. Well, the last half of that 70, 70 as week, and it really shouldn't be week, it should be called period of seven, not literal weeks, but if you want to use a fancy term, it would be heptad, or period of seven. The last half of that 70, heptad, is three and a half years, otherwise known as 42 months. We're not there yet. <clears throat> Unfortunately, if you had been a Jehovah's Witness in your past, you would have been taught that Jesus came back in 1914. That was a very dangerous falsehood because anybody who makes a false prediction in the Bible is condemned to death immediately for misleading the people. So that's something to repent of. 1914 was actually the beginning of World, world War, the very opposite of what will happen when Jesus comes back, where he will establish peace on the earth. So that was a colossal mistake. So we're not going to set any dates whatsoever, but only to point out that the last half of the 70th period of seven will feature the great tribulation and the activity of this terrifying figure, a person who is powerfully significant in a military way, am I right? Waging war in verse four. <coughs> and he then acts for that final three and a half year period leading up to the arrival of Jesus, what we call his parousia, that's the Greek word for arrival, Presence is a misleading word because that could be taken to be a secret presence. You don't want to do that. Nothing secret about the parousia of Jesus because in Luke 17, he said, just as the lightning flashes from east to the west, totally visible, so will the parousia, second coming, second arrival of Jesus be. So then this awful beast in verse 6 blasphemes God, his name, and as Sarah pointed out, name is not just how you spell your name, it's everything you are and everything you do. Your whole agenda is the name. So people who argue about the name of God, and they argue that we should use the proper Hebrew name of God, are not understanding the word name. Name doesn't mean how you pronounce your first name. If that were so, Jesus would have somewhere told them what that is, and how to pronounce it, because Jesus said in John 17, I've given them your name. Well, he never told them how to pronounce it. He never used the word Yehovah or Yahweh. You can use that if you want to, but don't insist on it because Jesus didn't. So this blaspheming God's name is a terrifying thing to do. And his tabernacle, that would be his dwelling place. God dwells in his tabernacle in heaven. That is, those who dwell in heaven. The Bible is not meant to be, in every case, scientifically precise. In the book of Genesis, we read that the birds, the birds that fly in the sky, we would say, they're flying on the face of the dome. If you look up into the sky, you see a dome. That's the covering of our home, the home for man. And the birds are flying, according to Genesis, on the face of just attached to it. Well, they're not. You know that that's scientifically not true. It doesn't matter. Aeroplanes fly on the face of the dome too, but they're not literally that far up in the sky. So be careful not to turn the book, the Bible then, into a scientific, technical term sort of piece of information where it obviously isn't. So in verse 7, it was also given to him. Have we read that yet? We haven't read any of this. We, we didn't read it. I did the reading there, sorry about that, I deprived my audience here of their reading, but let's ask Sarah to read verse 7. Uh, just Sorry. before what that, yeah. um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. so this is the events here now where you have mm. been reading mm. are following uh, chapter 12 chronologically, right? Chapter 12 is about the woman and the man-child. So it finished with the dragon stood on the sand of the mm -hmm. seashore, and yes. then it just flows into... 
it flows into that, and we're dealing with what part of the periods, uh, uh, the numbers of seven? We're dealing with what? The angels, are we not? And in chapter nine, we had woe number one, which was the fifth angel. You need to get the, the uh, program right here. <laughs> chapter nine, the fifth angel, is also called woe number one. Glad you brought that up. And where was woe number two? That would be the sixth angel in verse 13 of chapter 9. The sixth angel in a series of seven trumpets. This is the sixth of seven. It's also called the second woe. So then when you're reading, as you were earlier in chapter 9, verse 13, you're saying, oh, wait a minute, where's the seventh angel? And you'll find the seventh angel. Where would you find that? The seventh angel finally blows its blows its trumpet, 11. and that's in chapter 11, and that is the crowning moment of the whole Bible. That's 7, sorry, 11, 15, chapter 11, verse 15, is the third woe. Let me repeat that then, you've got seven trumpets. Trumpets number 5, 6, and 7 are also called woes. What would that mean? Disaster! Trouble, terrible disaster. So the seventh trumpet, equal to the third woe, is there in 1115. Listen to this one. The seventh angel, i.e. third woe, sounded. And there were loud voices, I would think there would be in heaven, saying, the kingdom, the government, singular, of all the world, every single, single human government, the kingdom of the world has now become when? At the third world, the seventh trumpet, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he, God and the Messiah, both of them, he particularly, God in this context, will reign forever and ever, along with Messiah. And you say, well, who is the he here? It doesn't matter. It's both God and the Messiah. They're going to be reigning forever and ever. And the 24 elders, these are angelic beings, and look, looking at uh, 1116, Sitting on their thrones before God, they fell on their faces as well as uh, they should exactly do that and worship God. And they said, we give thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, El Shaddai in Hebrew, the Pantocrator in Greek, that a word, that, a title that never applies to Jesus, only to the Father, the Almighty, you who are and you were, because you have now taken up your great power and you've begun to reign. I want everybody to understand that verse well. There's a sense in which God and Jesus are not reigning now. I know that God's totally in control, but he's not reigning in the sense meant by verse 17 because he begins to reign at the seventh trumpet, which is the third woe. And guess what? In 18, I, can't risk, I cannot spare reading 18. The nations were enraged, referring to Psalm 2, and the wrath of God came at this seventh angel, third woe. And the time came for the dead. Oh my goodness, the dead are going to be judged. So the dead are going to be raised and given their, their uh, reward, the faithful dead, that is. And the time came, you can measure it on your watch or your clock, to reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. Now you're in the story. You are one of the saints of God, if you're a genuine believer, and to destroy, sorry, I, let me finish that 18th verse because we cannot omit reading this. Those who fear your name, that's to say everything you are and everything you stand for, the small and the great, and this awful event means the destruction of those who are destroying the earth and those who are destroying unborn babies, which is an atrocious and awful thing to do, as Carlos was saying. So this is dramatically important stuff. You remember the Hallelujah Chorus, where George II, I think it was, asked that everybody stand up. I believe that Victoria may have said, Queen Victoria may have said the same thing, but some very uh, observant listener to us pointed out, I think George II, was the one who officially started saying, when we sing the story of the coming of the kingdom, we're all to stand up in deference to this extraordinary event. 
I'll come back, back in 13. <clears throat> We're going to continue the story in verse uh, 7. We read that. Go back to the, the, the fatal wound <clears throat> yeah. in verse 3. Mm. Ryrie says mm. um, the same word slain mm. is used in 5 6 of Christ's actual death. Okay. So here it may indicate a wound that normally would be fatal. Yes. So his fatal wound was healed. Apparently, Satan will miraculously restore Antichrist to life mm -hmm. in imitation of the resurrection of Christ. Good. No wonder the world will acclaim Antichrist. That's oh. nice. A nice comment from Schofield there. Ryrie. Ryrie. I always get that wrong. <laughs> Ryrie and Schofield will have the same sorts of views, at least. Okay. In verse 8. Uh, Carlos, could you read verse 8 for us, possibly? Have we done 7? Seven. Seven. We have done 7. seven. Seven. The beast was permitted to go to war against the saints mm. and conquer them. He mm. was given ruling authority over every tribe, people, language, nation. Yes. That's rather Eight. extensive, is it not? Making war mm. with the saints. That means the saints are still around. They haven't been pre-Great Tribulation rapture to heaven. And so this beast makes war with them. Verse 8. Who's got that? Everybody... Everybody living on earth will worship him, mm -hmm. those whose names were not written in the book of life, the book of life that belongs to the Lamb, slain from the beginning of the world. Right, and I like that translation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone, that is, whose name has not been written in the book of life. That's the registry or the register of the faithful of all times written in the book of life which occurs several times in Scripture, and that book of life is the book of life which belongs to the Lamb, 28 times a reference to Jesus, the Lamb, who has been slain from the foundation of the world. I prefer that translation. Those names were written before the foundation of the world, meaning that God had them in mind in some way. I don't think it means that God controlled every single marriage all that time, to produce a particular person, but the idea of the saints as a group of holy people was written in the book of life of the Lamb, and that Lamb was slain, killed, before the foundation of the world. Not literally. Jesus was not crucified before the foundation of the world, but in God's great plan, he was. God had, if you like, plan B, ready to deal with the sinful world, as it turned out to be from Genesis on. And that lamb then in the plan, we could call it plan B or plan A, I'm not going to argue about that. But the lamb was slain before Genesis 1. Now the lamb himself was not alive, of course, until he began to be and exist in the womb of his mother Mary. All human beings begin in the womb of their mother. Jesus is totally unique because he doesn't have a human father, and he was totally sinless. Now, in verse 9, if you've got ears to hear this, if you're listening, reminding us of the Shema, listen Israel, let him hear. We find that phrase in the Gospels too. Jesus said, please do not fail to understand what I'm saying. Can, can I just yes. make a point about eight? Yes. Um, you, you've taught us that all in Scripture does not necessarily mm. mean all. In my other version, I have everybody. Yes. So 8 says, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship him. Mm -hmm. And yet in 15, you have a class of people who would not worship Good him. point. So all doesn't mean all. All, it's right. Actually, I think also in verse 8, you could make the same point. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. That is, everyone whose name has not been written. Mm. Right. That implies that those whose names are written would not be included in that all, and you reinforce that point then with the other verse that you mentioned, which was which one? Fifteen. Fifteen. It was given uh, to this beast to give breath or energy or spirit to the image of the beast. We're ahead of the story here. So the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So absolutely right. Those are accepted, E-X-C-E-P-T-E-D, who are true believers. They don't worship the beast, but everybody else does. All right, what have we got then? Verse 10, 
if anyone is destined to uh, captivity or for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. That's rather striking. That reminds me very much of the saying of Jesus where he said, put up your sword, your defensive sword, he said to Peter. Anybody who takes a sword will die with the sword. That's found in the Gospels, that particular verse. Uh, is it Matthew 26, 52? Yeah. Good. That's good to link with verse 10. Matthew 26, 52. The defensive sword, not the aggressive sword, but the defensive sword was contem condemned by Jesus there and again here by Jesus in verse 10. This then highlights, you might say, the perseverance, the determination, the steadfastness, and the faith of the saints. The saints are the international Israel of God, the international people of God of all the ages, including, of course, Abraham, who is the father of the saints, the father of the faithful would be included. He won't be alive, of course, until the first resurrection, which is going to occur at the second coming. But all the faithful of all the ages would be in this category. All right, so that's the first beast, a rather redoubtable character, you would say, right? A terrible human being, otherwise known as the Antichrist. You'll find much about him in Second Thessalonians 2. As we go through this, this Sunday morning, it strikes me that you've got a lot of teaching to do to your neighbors, to your friends who will listen. It's going to take hours. No wonder Paul talked about the kingdom of God from dawn till dusk on another occasion for three years. Could you do it? Are you prepared to share the kingdom of God message for hours and hours for three months from dawn till dusk? If you're not, then you better get studied because you can't do it until you've studied it. And most people are not studying this material, not reading about it, talking about it extensively. But Jesus did and Paul did. Okay, so let's read on then, having uh, relaxed a little bit from that terrifying picture of the first beast, the Antichrist. What about verse 11? Let me read verse 11. We'll go a little bit further in this chapter. The beast from the earth. This is beast number two now with a capital B. Then I saw another beast, in this case a second one, a second beast coming up out of the earth or the land, it could be, and he had two horns like a lamb. What does that suggest to you? He's a parody of the true lamb. He was like a lamb with two horns. He's a sort of pseudo-Jesus. He's an anti-Christian figure or related to the earlier beast. And he's a parody. He's a counter-Messiah, if you like. So is that where we get all those medieval Satan Yes, horns, probably. The... I would think it might well be. I don't know the history of that. I yes. that. No, I hadn't noticed before. Two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like, like a dragon. And we've already defined the dragon as the serpent, as the Satan, as the devil of Genesis. So he's like a lamb, a very pleasant, mild-mannered person. But watch out for what he says. He speaks like a dragon. But this is, this is a, a ram, yeah. not a lamb. It looks like a lamb, but in reality, it's the ram of, is that the ram of Daniel? <coughs> Where does it say it's the ram? Which was Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a commentary here. Okay. That says that, obviously, <coughs> sheep do not have horns. Two horns like a lamb. Yeah, let's have a little study horns. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, the commentary... Uh, seems to be implied that this is that figure of the ram in the prophecies of if Daniel 8, you know, where 8 verse yeah. 3. Daniel, let's go back there. It's Daniel the 8 verse 3. And certainly Saint. you do have the anti-Christian figure in Daniel 8. Yeah, isn't it a ram in there? Uh, let's look at 8, 3 of Daniel. What do you have there? Daniel 8. Have a ram. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two mm -hmm. horns was standing in front of Good the canal. Point. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, mm -hmm. with the longer one coming up last. Okay. So A3 certainly talks about a ram with two horns. You're exactly right there. 
and that turns out to be the evil bad evil bad guy as well in the picture the rest of the chapter eight that's meter persia that's meter right. persia and the latter period of their rule in verse 23 the last extent the most future period of the rule of these four kingdoms in verse 22 and the ram with the two horns in verse 20 represents the kings of Medo-Persia. They seem to have then an existence in the final days. And guess what? In verse 23, a king, this would be the anti-Christian figure, insolent and skilled in a tree, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. In other words, demonic power pushes him. He will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and destroy mighty men and saints, holy people, and through his shrewdness, 25 of chapter 8 of Daniel, uh, he calls deceit, right? Magnifies himself in his heart. Paul uses this sin for 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. So you're absolutely right. You're right to, to call attention to this 8th chapter. Right, but Sarah is saying that it's not the answer. Yes, in its final extent, I think it, it probably is. is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah but the ram, it specifically says, the ram which yes. you saw with the two horns represents the kings yes. of Media and Persia. But they also have a final You're form. You're saying there could be a double prophecy. Well, yes, it's the final end of that power okay. who turns out to be, I think, certainly, in okay. verse 25, he, he will magnify himself in his heart, in verse 25. That's a reference to Second Thessalonians 2, Verse 3. So Paul Paul takes this chapter as a picture of Sorry, Antichrist. Sorry, I'm sending out Sarah's got a comment. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just saying, I don't think this applies to the false prophet in Revelation because a ram is not the same as a lamb. I think the point of he <coughs> looks like a lamb, mm -hmm. like he looks mm -hmm. soft and nice, mm -hmm. yeah. but he speaks as like a dragon. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think that's the point. I think he's. In chapter 8 of Daniel, the end of that chapter, because Paul quotes this stuff about magnifying himself, he quotes that in 2 Thessalonians about the Antichrist. So it all winds up in a final anti Christian Medo Persian power, if you like, Middle Eastern power. But because of that end of chapter 8, it strikes me uh, that you're dealing with that final wicked person who has a Medo Persian origin, according to that chapter, you're right? Okay, we are then back in chapter 13. See if we can finish this today. This is, a, as Sarah said, a very nice, soft-spoken figure who speaks like the devil. He's a liar from the beginning. He exercises, in verse 12, all the authority of beast number one that we read about earlier in the presence, in the presence of that beast number one. And he causes the earth, those dwelling in it, to worship the first beast. So he's the religious element, as I understand it, of this political beast, right? The political beast has a form of government, but his sidekick, his agent, the person who does his work for him, is the religious element, and he causes everybody to be worshipping the first beast, in verse 12, whose fatal wound, we remember, was healed. And he performs great signs, so miracles. Here the lesson in verse 13 is that a miracle in itself is not a proof that God is doing anything because the devil is able to do miracles. So be very careful then of subjective views by which you say, well, I saw this miracle happen in front of my very eyes. Yes, it might be God at work, but it might also be the devil. You have to be discerning. Um, yeah. Robin, mm. talk. Yes, good. Also in Daniel 8, mm. the lawless one is depicted as a shaggy goat, yes. I think. Yes, absolutely. Why not? Got a lot of images here, haven't we? This beast power then is like a goat, like a lamb. I see clearly, though, that this is the religious element in this system. In, in history class, mm. uh, doesn't they teach that that was Alexander the Great? Yeah, the ram? Certainly. The goat. Not the ram. No, the goat comes after the ram. Mm -hmm. Oh, the goat. Yeah. So the ram was Persia. He defeats Persia. The goat defeats Persia. Goat so yeah, it has Greece. a double. It can have a double yes. element. Prophecy. Goat is Greece. All the G's together. Yeah. Alexander the Great, so. the goat, and Greece. Mm -hmm. 
But all of them seem to converge on a final figure in chapter 8 and chapter 7 of Daniel, and especially then the book of Revelation, as to say Jesus, in dealing with these subjects in Revelation 13, is taking up all of that information and applying it to the future, which is the relevant part for us. All right, we've got then in verse 14... Uh, after commenting on the signs, the miracles that this sidekick, this agent, he's called the PR man. I like that. John MacArthur refers to this person as the PR man of the beast. I like that. The PR man of the beast. A shaliach, an agent of the beast. 14. What does he do? Who's got 14 for us? And by the signs mm -hmm. he was permitted to perform on behalf of the beast, he deceived those who live on the earth. Mm. He told those who live on the earth to make an image to the beast yes. who had been wounded by the sword, mm. but was still alive. Mm -hmm. 15. He was permitted to breathe life into the cult statue of the beast so that he could speak, ordering anyone who did not worship the statue to be put to death. 16. And he causes, that's the second beast, all, the small and the great, people of every rank, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, <coughs> to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And okay. he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Mm -hmm. This calls for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Let him. Uh, sorry, here is wisdom. Mm -hmm. Let the one who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, mm -hmm. and his number is six, six. Six, six. right. And so endless speculation, of course, has been attached to this verse. People calculated the word Hitler was 666. You can do that if you start with A is 101 and B and so on. Nero, you can make it. Nero was thought to be, six, obviously, six, in his day. But this is a reference to the future. So when this man arrives, finally, it will be clear that his number is 666. But I want to comment then on the fact that he gave breath or spirit, in verse 15, to That's his scary. image. That's very scary. He wow. gives energy and spirit. Sounds like a resurrection. I got it. <clears throat> right. This is a terrifying wow. parody, then, counter figure to the true Jesus. And you then have the commercial element here. The commercial element is, is paramount, right? You can't buy and sell unless you subscribe to this uh, system. You are excluded from the commercial market entirely unless you join up with this very evil person and his image. This takes me, Anthony, to yeah. a question I always have Wonder. had. Yes. Not who is God, but... Um, about signs and wonders oh, cool. and this insistence mm. from even the time of Jesus, mm. right? Hey, just show us this, Jesus, show us that. Mm. And Jesus rebukes them and says, a wicked generation seeks after signs. Yes. But we're still seeking after signs. Yes. Ten so it's scary to me that self-professed Christians, mm -hmm. you know, even, I mean, <clears throat> not even a sign on this level, right? Mm. Not even a sign on this level, yet they're sucked in to so-called uh, tongues yes. or so-called healing. Yes. And we're not even at this stage of that real no. satanic signs and wonders. Same tendency. So what should that tell us as, as, mm. Very as great Christians? Danger. Like, we should be warned. Why are we always seeking yeah. after signs without right. the verification of is this a true person of, of God? Is this a true prophet of yes. God? No, it's a fair warning. Of course, you can go to the opposite extreme and say that God doesn't do anything. I've even heard people say that nobody can baptize anybody today. We had that on email this week. Nobody's authorized to baptize anybody. Nobody's authorized to do the gospel of the kingdom now because we don't have those signs. That's an error on the extreme opposite. So we have to be very cautious, but you are absolutely right. The devil then gets his audience, gets a following by doing miracles and Jesus, as you say, rebuked that idea. On the other hand, God does work miraculously in various ways, not, I think, at the level of the apostles. I'm glad you mentioned that because we had this question twice, I think, this week on email. 
You cannot have apostles today like the twelve, at the level of the twelve. Why is that? Because the twelve, to be an apostle, you had to have seen Jesus literally, and you haven't. Because Jesus did show up literally to what more than 500 people, and he showed up to Paul. That was the end of the appearances of Jesus, so you cannot claim to be an apostle at that level. There are no Agabuses today who predict things infallibly. They don't make mistakes. You mustn't make mistakes if you're a true uh, predictor or prophet. Agabuses don't exist. However, we should not say that God doesn't work miraculously in our lives. I think he does. We have to keep an eye on that, watch out for that. So it's a question of judgment and discernment. So I'm glad you raised that as a point. I want to point to something that struck me as interesting, verse 16. <clears throat> he causes the second beast, the small the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand. That's the symbol of what you do, the symbolic language. Your right hand is what you do, and your forehead is what you think. Your forehead is, if you like, the gateway to your mind, is it not? Now, where does this right hand and forehead language come from? Have you ever thought of that? Sure. From the Shema. Go back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 8. I don't know what the significance of this is entirely. I'm not going to be dogmatic. But back in Deuteronomy 6, well, the forehead is verse the right? 8, of course. You shall bind these commandments in 6, 8 of Deuteronomy. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and as frontals, or the margin says, as between your eyes on your mind. That's where this comes from. And you write them on the doorposts, and the Jews did literally, and they wore phylacteries, and they had little bits of scripture, you know, on their foreheads. So that language is interesting. Why does that come up in connection I, with I the I think base? it's this counterfeit nature of... Mm the satanic system. Absolutely. So you just read like a lamb. Yes. Right? We read he comes on a white horse as yes. well. Yeah. So it's always this counterfeit. Mm. There's a counterfeit seed that turns out to be tares. Mm -hmm. So I think it's following on that. Track. Oh, absolutely. No question about that. It's interesting to me, though, that the frontlets, the gateway to your mind and your hand, takes us back directly to the question of defining God correctly. So false God. the Shema issue, God as one, could turn out to be even greater. Well, we know it's a false God. He sits in the holy place Absolutely. and says he's God. Yes. And Same now we see him, just to correct my, mm. myself, mm. we see uh, the, the satanic figure here yes. giving life to... It's not a resurrection. It's it's even more scary to me. It's yes. given life to an inanimate That's object. Right. Can you imagine how scary that is? Mm. Yeah. Very scary. Mm -hmm. Yes, the power of God. It's very significant to me that the frontlets, the, the, the mind and the hand, take us back to defining God correctly. And the point we need to establish for our friends out there is that Jewish people, when they recited the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 verse 8, they meant that God was one person, one single person. The Trinity expressly says that God is three persons in one. So the issue of defining God, I'm making that connection between what we read in Revelation and Deuteronomy 6. So defining God might turn out to be ultimately more important than we realize now. Let me just say this, that if somebody believes in the Trinity now, He's very genuine, very sincere, and there are many such people. The sky doesn't fall, and the lightning doesn't flash, and the thunder doesn't come, and the earthquakes don't happen when people say they believe that God is three but one but one but three. That's true. God doesn't demonstrate any kind of displeasure at the present time. Nevertheless, in the long term, it might be very, very significant that we are de defining God as one single person. If you want the best argument with your friends on that point, here it is. God is defined by singular personal pronouns thousands upon thousands of times. That's a very easy argument. When God says he's Yahweh, he says, I am Jehovah. 
I am Yehovah, I am Yahweh, I am God, everybody's going to know that I am Yahweh. And you say to your neighbors, how many persons is I? One. That's interesting, not three. He doesn't say we are one, ever. And when you read the word God in the Bible, it never means a triune God, not one. You'd think that if these Bible readers believed in a triune God, somewhere when they said God or Lord or Lord God, somewhere you could show that that word God means a triune God. The answer is they've never heard of the Trinity. The Trinity is absolutely foreign to Jesus and foreign to Paul. And Jesus did say in Mark 12, agreeing with a friendly Jew, that God was a single individual person because of the 14 forms. Your children who do grammar at school will enjoy this. 14 forms of the singular pronoun. I, me, mine, and my. Thou, thee, thine, and thy. He, him, himself, and his. Even self. God keeps saying, I myself, I myself. How many selves is that? So I would insist then that you teach your children that God is one single person. Otherwise, you're in danger of saying, if you say Jesus is God, you're creating a rival to God. I wouldn't go there. That's very unwise. You're also saying Jesus couldn't be human. Well, you can't be human and God at the same time. That's just impossible because Jesus died and God cannot die. You know those arguments. But try the singular personal pronoun argument on your friends, and you might get them to think and realize that God is a single person. Anyway, that comes clearly in our chapter it's about the mind. Yes, the demon says that to me, and even the demons believe in no, the one God. The demons said, "We are legion." Yes, well, there were multiple demons there. In that particular case, there was more than it's one demon. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, the single voice says, "We are legion." Yes, that's because he had he had lots of demons. That guy had lots of demons. Yes. Many genes. I didn't think about yep. that. Yep. Um, yep. We have a couple of comments here. Mm. God, uh, Michelle, God permits all this to happen, but the power to do it comes from Satan. Yes. And there's a verse that she's alluding to, mm -hmm. looking for. Uh, Tracy, this is why we must talk about and share these end time events, often with those we teach. Yes. Especially the next generation. Mm. Or the warnings will not be passed down and people will be deceived. That's right. Very true. Yeah, that's a good point from Michelle. I'm so glad for the internet, by the way, because what we're recording now, until somebody stops the internet and they would like to stop it, the devil would like to stop it, no doubt, we nevertheless are propagating this permanently by getting this on record. So thanks to Michelle for a good comment. It's yeah. also um, important to remember that even though these events are fantastical, mm. Christians are still here. In, yep. in fact, anybody who believes in the pre-trip rapture yep. should, when they see the word saints in verse 7, they should say to themselves, what are they doing there? Exactly right. And they're not only there in verse 7, they're there in, in verse 15. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Um, this, um, yeah. 1318. Yes. Now, this verse has been popularized by the a movie called The Omen, oh, has it? that came out okay, I didn't even know. before I was born, in mm -hmm. the 70s. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and, and there's this notion out there, Anthony, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, I think in the churches, I think due especially to the influence of that movie, that this number mm -hmm. of the, the beast yep. is actually under person. So how would you understand this number? Is it just regarding the, the like, like others believe, mm. the name, the actual name of the person adds up to that number, or is it an actual number under person? Because this movie makes oh, I see. the point that the, that, that actual number really? is on the I child. I have no idea. I, oh, on his head. Actual yeah, a mark. Okay. It's an act, so is it an actual mark? I have no idea. Individual? I have no idea. All I know is that the science of gematria, that's G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A, -E -E gematria, is the sign, or the science, I should say, of adding up the value of names. And so we've told you week after week that Jesus, Jesus in modern Greek pronunciation, Jesus adds up to 888, precisely. That's 1 over the 7 superabundance, the new beginning, 
And this is the worst possible number. You can have six. That's the number of the creation of man, I think. And man who goes wrong, 666. Triple sixes. How that appears exactly, it doesn't have to be written on his forehead, literally, for us to realize that. So we will have to wait and see, but I think the point is very clear. Briary says, somehow, unknown to us, this number will play an important part in the identification yes. of the Antichrist in a future day. I like that. So, Good I guess comment. we could say scholarship in general right mm. now mm. Uh, uh, understands it as a, a value of regarding the, not, the yes. name. Absolutely. And the sort of Christian entertainment world. Yes, <laughs> cash in on that. A mark on the, on the person. Yes. Uh, Robin says... It's interesting, there's a trinity of beasts yes. counting the image in this chapter. Yes, yes. You've got a beast, number one, beast number two, and you've got his image as well. That makes three, a trinity, if you like. Um, Tracy says, the point is that the beast and false prophet are not just powerful in and of themselves. Satan gives them power. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Satan's last attempt to deceive the world. So there's a good comments from Robin, other other folk there. You know, there's that other image, I don't know if we've gotten to it, where there's three spirits. Is it spirits or frogs that come out of Yes. Frogs, is it? Three frogs. That so would be three demons. Right. Frogs are symbols of demon power, and three of them come out from the mouth of the false prophet or the beast. Which one? I've forgotten. Somebody could just get that fact established for us. Where do the free, three frogs come from? The mouth of the beast um, or the false prophet? Which one? I think false prophet. Let me see. Is it three frogs? Three frogs, probably. Um, we mustn't get that fact misrepresented. 1613. All right. I saw three unclean spirits. Oh, yes. like frogs. Yes. From the mouth of the dragon, all right, and the mouth of the beast, and the, the mouth part. of the all right. a trinity. I did not Within know that. Trinity. That's interesting. Within. Sixteen and which verse? Thirteen. 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 Let me read that. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, who is the Satan, the devil, the serpent, and out of the mouth of the beast, who is this political leader. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, who is the PR man, the sidekick of the beast, three demons, like frogs, unclean animals. Frogs are unclean spirits, of course, means demons. The word spirits, I want to get this on the record, the word spirits taken by itself without qualification. In other words, not the spirits of just men made perfect, that those are human beings, spirits of human beings, but spirits unqualified by itself, spirits always means demons, fallen angels, false angels, and no difference here. Demons, the demons believe in the one God, even, James said. They could, he could have said they're the spirits of demons, or the spirits believe in the one God, performing signs. So it reinforces your point, Carlos, that miracles can be done by false gods and demons. Satan is the ruler of the demons, by the way. He's the ruler of a whole crowd of demons, otherwise known as Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, also known as Belial in Paul once, B-E-L-I-A-R, a very important figure. And there are people who say that he doesn't exist. They need to rethink that with all urgency. You know, Anthony, hmm. um, if you know a little bit of history, it's scary to see yeah. the number three pop up yes. in uh, in reference to religion, really? paganism. Really? Uh, so there's a good article people can look at. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Triple DT. Triple DT. And it gives you a list of from Egypt mm -hmm. to Babylon. Yes. to They all have triple DTs yes. that they refer to as one God. That, that's right. Triads and Trinity is exactly right. So I think we made our point that we're against yes. the Trinity. We're against the Trinity. I think we've made that clear. Uh, we got a reference. Triple deity. And that brings us to the end of our rather hectic study today. I hope you got something from that. By all means, check these things out and ask any good questions you may wish to ask. All right. Um, the 
Bible translation. Oh, yes. What do you want to say? It's available on Kindle right now for sale. Seven dollars for Kindle. The actual hard copies we're hoping will come this week. Oh, yeah. Perhaps this week. By the end of the month, at least. But Available on Kindle, you say, for $7. That's a good price for... This is my second edition Download, of the trans... Yeah. We are, mm. according to Amazon, the number one new release <laughs> in other Christian Bibles. <laughs> okay. Praise the Lord. Mm. Okay. Number one. There number happen to be one. only two, but we're number one. We're number it? one with a bullet. <laughs> okay. All right, Carlos, thank you for that um, piece of advertising... I would ask if Sarah would close in prayer today for us, and we are most grateful to all of you out there listening. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this study. Thank you for your scripture, the words of Jesus in Revelation. Um, thank you for everyone listening and, and the fellowship that we have with them. We remember those who are sick. Uh, we remember nine-year-old Ian in Nicaragua that you would give him healing. Mm. Um, others, we remember Joanna who has cancer in Florida, that you would heal her and, and encourage her as well. Yes. And others who may be sick um, in need of healing, we remember all of them yeah. before your throne. And we pray for the day when your kingdom comes and there won't, won't <clears throat> be sickness that mm. we have to deal with. We pray for that day to come, and we pray for doors to open so that the, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world so that that day will come. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.